I think uh, some of you, or probably some of you, know already uh, uh, Jose, and it's a great pleasure to have you to have you here. So many of you, of course, don't know Jose. So maybe I can present her briefly. So Rosel has been he did her PhD in Barcelona with Garcia Val, uh, together also in a collaboration with Texas University. And then she went to the US and went to Germany. And uh, to the, the US, she was with Peter Hirschfeld, which is very well known in the field of low temperature theory. And uh, in Germany, he is now at the University of Frankfurt, the Goethe University. Goethe University is probably one of the largest universities in, in Germany. And uh, she has been also vice rector of the university. And uh, uh, she is now working on a lot of uh, very nice things from the point of view of the theory. And I think the best is to give her the stage because it's uh, yours. Thank you very much for being here, Jose. Muchas gracias, Germán. Al menos eso lo tengo que decir en, uh, en uh, castellano. Es, es uh, un placer para mí estar uh, hoy en Madrid y ver um, a muchos amigos y amigas que hacía tiempo que no veía. Uh, y ahora continuaré en inglés. Um, so today what I would like to do in this colloquium is to um, present you and discuss with you some uh, strategies that we have been followed in recent years to design quantum material with exotic properties. And along the way, I'm going to define a little bit what I mean with exotic properties and what we mean with quantum materials. And all from a theoretical point of view, but, also, but of course, having a lot of contact with experiments. The picture that you see here uh, will come later on. I mean, this is an ethereal structure of graphene with uh, ruthenium trichloride, a uh, 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 quantum uh, spin system. And uh, I will tell you then what, uh, why we are interested, among others, on this type of materials. So to set the stage, uh, let me start by defining what we understand by quantum materials. So for us, a piece of iron, for instance, is a quantum material because we view it as a system, if we consider one cubic centimeter of iron, it consists of 10 to the 23 electrons, which are interacting among each other. And it is the simultaneous action of the properties of these electrons, like the fact that they have a charge and they have a spin, they occupy orbital states and they interact with the lattice. So all this simultaneous action gives rise with two collective properties and what we call emergence of distinct phases of matter. And here I would like to quote this very nice work uh, from Phil Anderson, More is Different, where at that time he was indeed posing these ideas that what is nice about uh, condensed matter physics is that by considering individual actors, like here the electrons, where when they act together, they get they give rise to new phases of matter that you cannot predict by just knowing these unities uh, on, on their own. The, this concept of emergence of phases is not only in the microscopic world, but it's also in the macroscopic world. If you think about, for instance, flock of birds that you see very nicely in the sky. So if you consider the properties of a bird, you will never predict the fact that they can build these wonderful patterns. And this is what we also call uh, an emergent behavior because it's a behavior that you cannot foresee from the individual uh, individual here birds, but it's because of their collective action that you find these um, emergent patterns. But I will go back to the quantum world and why we call it quantum is because we are going to deal with these um, elementary particles, which are electrons. And these are really in with uh, deep in the quantum world. So the topic I would like to talk today in order to present to you a little bit this, uh, the title of my talk is strategies to design quantum material. Um, I'm going to concentrate on a very important phenomenon in condensed matter physics, which is magnetism. And let me start from a historical point of view, just to learn how um, these concepts have been developing along the years and how one has been uh, trying to understand the origin of magnetism um, starting already in the last century. 
So let's go back 100 years ago. So we are in the 20s and um, 100 years ago, as you know, in the 20s, the quantum mechanics was really getting emerging as a new theory to understand the microscopic world. So there were many open questions of the behavior that was being observed in materials that could not be understood. So for instance, one of the very classical questions at the time was, why does iron uh, retain residual magnetism in the absence of an external magnetic field? So where does this ferromagnetic uh, behavior come from? And this was a question that, uh, for instance, in Germany, there were many scientists trying to understand the microscopic origin of ferromagnetism. One of them was Wilhelm Lenz, who was at the University of Hamburg. And um, the way he was thinking about that is, well, we are now in the 20s, so we know that uh, the constituent of these materials are going to be these electrons, we have spins. So he was thinking about the possibility that such a behavior could come from the interaction between spins. So he went to his uh, PhD student, who was Ernst Ising, and told him, why don't you take a simple model of spins? It basically consider spins just with two degrees of freedom. So bas uh, basically that I have um, spin up and spin down and consider short range interactions so that they are only nearest. There is an interaction that you put into nearest neighbors. And let's analyze this model, which is what we know nowadays as the uh, Ising model. So if the J is negative, you will, you will favor that the spins are going to align parallel to each other. If the J is uh, positive, you are going to favor that the spins align anti-parallel to each other. So he had the task as a PhD student to analyze this model and find out whether this model could bear ferromagnetism. So as you know, what we do, physicists always try to start with the simplest case. And this is what he did. So the simplest case is just to take a linear chain. So the one dimensional, um, what we know as the one dimensional easy model. And in fact, <clears throat> the one dimensional easy model, you can solve it very nicely analytically and it doesn't have a ferromagnetic transition at any finite temperature. So with that, Ising concluded that, um, and you, this is just taken from his uh, PhD that was published in this uh, publication here in this uh, Zeitschrift of Physique. It is shown that such a model, the one dimensional, does not yet have ferromagnetic properties. And this is the danger that we have in physics that we tend to uh, generalize whatever findings we have to um, the most general case. And this is what he did. So then he said, and this statement also, also extends to higher dimensions. So with this statement, he was basically saying, forget about this model. This is not the right model to describe ferromagnetism in materials in any dimension. But um, uh, in fact, uh, Ernst Ising, he, the war came and he had to flee to the US and he was um, in fact in the US, he, he then went to be a teacher. So he left physics for a long time. And um, this is an interesting uh, life, the, the one he has. He, had, he was a very good teacher, uh, but you see that he has been, uh, uh, in fact, due to this model, he's very well known. So then of course, um, many other colleagues were not happy with this extension of the, mo uh, of, of, of the uh, results. And here what I'm showing is um, Werner Heisenberg. So what he did is, okay, maybe the Ising model was simple. Let me consider a more complex model by um, considering not only that we have the Z component of the spins that interact with each other, but that we have the full spin um, uh, a model given by this full, full spin spin interaction. So, this is what we know nowadays as the Heisenberg model. And it was Rudolf Peyers who, in uh, 1936, in fact, he went to analyze what happens with this model when I go to higher dimensions. And indeed, if you go to two dimensions, 
the model, the easy model, has a phase transition into a ferromagnetic phase. So this model, it's a very simple model, but it bears ferromagnetism uh, as soon as you go to higher dimensions than what. And um, later on, it was Lars Onsaga who managed to get an analytic solution of this model into dimensions. I have to say that for the three-dimensional case, there is no analytic solution to the model because it's very it's a very difficult combinatoric problem. However, there are many numerical, uh, there is a lot of numerical work on this model. And nowadays, this model is extremely powerful to describe uh, magnetism, so ferromagnetism, antiferromagnetism in materials. And not only, so this is the nice thing about these um, simple models that can be extended to uh, being applied to many other uh, fields of research. So for instance, uh, here what I'm showing is it's being applied in neural network activity. It's applied to understand this patterns of flock of birds. And I'm just um, quoting here uh, Eric Weinstein, who has a very nice way of describing the what is the essence of this model. So the ICE model tries to imitate the behavior in which individual elements, in our case, these were the spins, but it can be animals, it can be protein folds, it can be social behavior. So this, uh, the behavior of these individual elements modify their behavior so as to conform to the behavior of the other individuals in their vicinity. This is what the Eisen model is doing. By um, adapting the, uh, in our case for the spin system, by adapting to the interaction of the neighbor spins, you give rise to phase transitions such as a ferromagnetism. So this was now the last century. So now we understood what ferromagnetism, antiferromagnetism, is um, we are now, however, in the 21st century, and there is now a change of paradigm because we are now in a century where we understand, well, we think we understand quantum mechanics and we really use it as a tool to describe what we see in our microscopic world. And which is the change of, change of paradigm. So um, what we want to do now, and this is what I'm going to call exotic uh, uh, spin states, we want to now create states that go beyond these ferromagnets and antiferromagnets. This magnetism that we understood how to describe, that we have uh, many theories like the Landau theory, it's a very powerful theory to describe a phase transition to this type of magnetic states. So can we create now new state of matters in magnetic systems that are neither nor? And this is what I want to do now um, and it is very much related to the development that is happening now in the 21st century. So, <clears throat> so we want to not have uh, this long range magnetic order, but we want to have exotic states. So in fact, here I'm quoting again, Phil Anderson. So Phil Anderson was, uh, has been, so he died uh, just a few years ago, so in 2020. So he has been one of the um, most, uh, I would say prolific um, physicist in solid state physics. He has brought a lot of uh, a lot of concepts in uh, in the understanding of uh, uh, of what happens in in condensed matter physics. He has very nice works. He uh, of course got the Nobel Prize for one of those. And at that time, so this was the seventies. He was already uh, in fact thinking about how can we get uh, magnetic states, which are not these ordered ferro anti -ferro. And basically he was pointing out at the importance of having the quantum effects remaining up to very low temperatures so that the quantum effects are the most important. So the quantum fluctuations are not killed by any type of long range, uh, magnetic long range order like it happens in the ferro anti -ferro magnetic. So um, why he was thinking about that, and then um, basically he started to bring about this concept of quantum spin liquids. So why was he thinking about that? The reason was because, um, as I was showing to you, this ferromagnet or antiferromagnet, if you have a square lattice, it's very easy to place your spins in a configuration that is going to be antiferromagnetic. 
But if you have a lattice like a triangular lattice, and we are in this world of magnetism, I'm putting my, myself always in systems that are insulators, in fact, MOT insulators, MOT, because these are systems that are insulators because of strong uh, electron correlation. And the magnetism is happening because I have very localized states in um, my lattice. So he was thinking about if I have a triangular lattice where I have um, spins situated in this in, at each um, uh, corner of the triangular lattice and they have an antiferromagnetic interaction that means that what favors their interaction is to be opposite in spin. In such type of lattices um, as per construction, per geometry, the third spin, there is no way that I can put this third spin antiferromagnetically aligned to uh, the other two. So this is what we call geometric frustration, that the geometry of the lattice doesn't allow you to build this nice antiferromagnetic uh, state that I was talking about, that we were having in the, uh, in, in, in the first um, slides. So because of this geometric frustration, I have to think about uh, the fact that I'm going to expect that this system is going to have as a ground state a state which has nothing to do with an antiferromagnet or a ferromagnet. So, and here is where we come into really uh, using a very deep concept in quantum mechanics, which is the concept of quantum entanglement. So if I have this type of frustration, most probably the way uh, that I can, uh, or that, I, that the system will, will, um, uh, let, will go into, a uh, state where breaks this type of frustration is by making use of the concept of quantum entanglement. What is quantum entanglement? So there has been this, uh, in 2022, there was the Nobel Prize given to Alain Aspect, John Clauser, and Anton Seidlinger precisely for their experiments on proving quantum entanglement in um, photons. And this is what I'm going, this concept of quantum entanglement I'm going to use it for spins now. So the state I was showing to you, the ferromagnetic state for a system of n spins, 10 to the 23 spins, is basically a product state. So this is not an entangled state in the sense that uh, we, we, uh, we know quantum entanglement. But now what I'm going to use is this type of entangled states where I'm going to have linear combinations of uh, different possible different um, orientations of my spin. So, <clears throat> so then the solution to uh, try to describe the, the state for such a triangular lattice is to build, and with that I sort of release this problem of the frustration, mm -hmm. is that I build my state by making, um, by making my, um, my wave function as a product of this uh, entangled pair of states, which we call it balance one. So the so here this quote this is uh, probably too small here, but this is a, a nice um, I don't know you 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 can't see it. Well, this is about the Schrödinger the Schrödinger cat, and there is this lady that comes with a cat uh, to the owner of the cat and tells him, well, I have good and bad news to you. And because you know the cat can can be uh, uh, alive or dead, so we are having here in the in the of course in the macroscopic world we don't have that because we don't have the coherence, but in the microscopic we have that. So this entangled state it's basically a linear combination of up and down. So um, that this spin can be up uh, is uh, there is a combination of this up and down with uh, this down and this up, so that you can have the probability of the two. So <clears throat> the state for such kind of uh, lattices is going to be a linear combination, the wave function of these uh, balance bond entangled uh, states. And of course, I just draw here an entanglement of nearest neighbors, but you can have this at very long uh, range. This is what is no, known as the resonating balance bond state. Now, why is this state so interesting? It's interesting because of the following. First of all, it, it is a completely different concept to the case of a ferromagnet or antiferromagnet. And second is the excitations to this kind of wave function, so ground state wave functions, are completely um, 
different to what we understand as excitations in a magnetic system. So usually in a ferromagnet, the excitations that you have is you flip a spin and this has higher energy and you create a wave, which is what we understand as a magnon wave. However, here the excitations are going to be um, different type of objects. And this is um, what we call uh, fractionalized excitations. So what kind of excitations do we have in these systems that have these geometric frustrations? So what we have to do to understand excitations, we have to fractionalize our elementary particles. So we fractionalize the spin into what we call a spin-on, which has spin but has no charge, and a holon, which has charge but no spin. So in frustrated systems, you will always uh, at so, so for, for this, the excitations in frustrated systems are excitations where you fractionalize your particles. And these excitations live in the system, but it's an excitation that needs this collective effect of all the interactions to live there. You don't have that in the vacuum. So on the concept of fractionalization, it's a concept that in quantum Hall effect was very well known, but not in the field of, uh, let's say, quantum uh, materials in, and, and uh, spin materials. So now um, we, we come to the, to the level where we, where we can now define what is these new states of, of matter that we expect to have in uh, systems that have this geometric frustration where quantum fluctuations are very large and um, are always, so they are not suppressed by going down in temperature. So the quantum spin liquid is a cooperative quantum phase with fluctuating spins down to lowest temperature and where there is no symmetry breaking. However, there is a long range, there is not a magnetic long range, but there is a, a long range entanglement ground state and the excitations are fractionalized. So now you say, well, this is, um, this is um, a very exotic, well, you could tell why we are interested in this type of states, I will show you in a moment. But what interests us now is where can we look for this type of states, especially this fractionalized excitations, as I'm, uh, I will show to you, are um, something that it, one is very much uh, looking for to have real, a realization of that. So where do we look now to find the realization of this type of quantum spin liquid and these fractionalized excitations? I was showing to you the example of geometric frustration with a triangular lattice. I have to say though that, and this is a disclaimer now, the case of the triangular lattice, even if it was um, a motivation uh, a case uh, that motivated Phil Anderson to start thinking about these concepts, and it's very useful to uh, introduce the concept, the ground state of this um, lattice is in fact an antiferromagnet with 120 degrees. So still the system managed to get rid of the frustration by um, orienting the spins 120 degrees. However, this lattice, which is nowadays a very much intensively um, studied lattice, the Kagome lattice, indeed this lattice bears as a ground state a quantum spin liquid. So the, the type of uh, spin liquid that I was showing to you with fractionalized excitations. Now there is in fact a second way of having this uh, frustration. So these quantum fluctuations surviving at any temperature, which is by what we call Hamiltonian engineering. So what is Hamiltonian engineering? So the idea is if you want to have that quantum fluctuation survive, just write down a Hamiltonian, and we are now talking about spin Hamiltonian, where it doesn't, it contains non-commuting uh, non uh, terms. So if it contains non-commuting terms, this uh, is, it, this is uh, creating a frustration in your system. And one of the most uh, studied now um, models uh, on, of this type is the Kitayev Hamilton. So let me go a little bit step by step. First of all, realizations of these lattices. So of the geometric frustration, we have, um, for instance, here a material, this is just a mineral that was a very boring mineral, but when one found out, finds out what this mineral is based on, 
This mineral is uh, based on, if you look at the crystal structure, it's basically a layered crystal structure of Kagome lattices where we have at the Kagome uh, corners, we have coppers and here copper is um, spin one half. So it's a mod insulator, which is re realizing a spin one half Kagome lattice. And this system indeed doesn't order at very low temperatures. And it has been discussed a lot whether this is a mani uh, manifestation of a spin liquid. So how do the excitations look like? This is in elastic neutron scattering experiments. And it looks, the excitations look extremely diffuse. And diffuse excitations, um, it tells you you don't have magnons, well-defined magnons, so it may come from these fractionalized excitations. However, I have also to say, these materials have a lot of disorder effects, and one has to be very careful to analyze what is, uh, comes from disorder effects and what comes from intrinsic uh, skin liquid type of behavior. But what I'm more interested in is in the second type of, um, second type of man manifestation of uh, frustration, uh, which is this uh, KITAIF uh, model. So what is the KITAIF model? Since I started with the Ising model, is nothing else as a type of Ising model, but a very special type of. So I start with the honeycomb lattice, and the idea is to write a Hamiltonian where I have nearest neighbor Ising interactions. This gamma is y, x, and z, depending on the bond, so that these Ising nearest neighbor interactions are bond dependent. So that means that if I am in this bond, um, these two spins are going to interact with the Z component. If I am in this bond, these two spins are going to interact with the Y component. Uh, and if it, I am in this bond, these two spins are going to interact with the X component. And this is a very frustrated model. And you can see it here because put yourself this spin here has to interact with the Z component to the neighbor to the right with the Y component to the neighbor to the left and with the X component or the Z component to the neighbor uh, down. And because the three spin uh, components don't commute with each other, this uh, creates a lot of frustration of the system. So this model, uh, I have to say that there are precursor models to that one in, sol in condensed matter. And I just want to mention the compass model, which was uh, one of the first people that introduced the compass model was uh, Daniel Komsky, when he was studying, uh, in fact, the orbital degrees of freedom in strongly correlated um, materials, and he was introducing this type of bond-dependent interactions. Now, the merit of uh, Kitayev has been to solve exactly this model. And now, how, the, how does one solve this model? So again, we have a situation where we have this uh, strong frustration. And I was showing to you that when we have this strong frustration, we are going to expect a um, large entanglement and the excitations are, um, we need to fractionalize our uh, operators in order to uh, release this frustration. And this is what he did. So basically what he does is he writes the spin operators in terms of Majorana fermions, so in fact, four Majorana fermions. And Majorana fermions are particles that the particle is the same as the antiparticle, and these are fermions, but the particle is itself as the antiparticle. So this is a fractionalized um, particle. So if you write every spin operator in terms of these um, four, four uh, Majoranas, what happens? So this is the process that we do, is we have a frustrated situation, we fractionalize. Um, basically, you break. You break your. You can think it in a in a in a in a way. You can think that you break your uh, your elementary operator into these uh, fractionalized uh, operators. And by doing that, here's the math. By doing that, what happens is that your Hamiltonian, you will get some uh, constants of motion so that your Hamiltonian becomes quadratic. And a quadratic Hamiltonian, you know how to solve. So the solution of this Hamiltonian is the fact that you have the ground state is a Z2 spin liquid, and it has gapless Majorana fermions. So this, this, um, this 
uh, fractionalized particles that you introduce have in fact a physical meaning that it comes as a collective type of excitation in the system, as well as, as these uh, uh, fluxes, gap fluxes. So this is a beautiful physics that you would like to have it uh, realized. So why are we so much interested in these fractionalized excitations? So one of the um, applications, and this was a suggestion by Alexei Kitayev, that was one of the reasons why he was also looking into these models is um, to use these fractionalized excitations for constructing topological quantum computing computers. And why? Because um, if you have that these Majorana fermions are non-abelian, then any operation, so you build up your qubits by these, uh, by these, with these Majorana fermions, and the operations are going to be protected by the topology of these um, fractionalized operators. And therefore, it, uh, with that, you can build a quantum computer because you don't have lo lose it, uh, losses, losses uh, when you do the operations. This is one of the suggestions um, that uh, some suggestions have a more, uh, more successful than others. Uh, this suggestion has some issues, but just to show you that um, you can use of these very fundamental uh, fundamental concepts also as you can view it as possible applications. So now I don't know how I'm doing with the time. Okay, so now once I have this, uh, we have this model, now we would like really to uh, go and find materials where we have realization of this model. So we want to first, can we find materials that are the realization of this model? And once we identify materials, are these materials really what we, ex what uh, a realization of this model? So there's these two questions. And let me start with the first one. So where can we realize this type of a bond dependentizing model? So Already the, the, the fact that you want to have interactions that are bond dependent is telling you that we need to have as entities, these spins need to have a very strong coupling with the orbitals because this is what it's going to allow you to have this bond dependence. So we need that strong spin orbit coupling into the description of our systems. So um, in fact, uh, George Ackley and Gideon Kalulin uh, proposed how you could have a realization of this type of interactions that let me go through them um, in two minutes. So the idea is you take four or five D electrons or heavy electrons, um, in fact, in a configuration of five electrons in an octahedral environment so that you have that your D orbitals are split it into T to G and G because of the crystal field splitting. And if you have five uh, electrons, this is the feeling that you will have. A strong spin orbit coupling gives you an extra splitting in your uh, crystal field. And therefore, at the end, what you have is these uh, spins, but these are spin orbit coupled spins uh, due to the strong spin orbit coupling. And now once you have these states defined, basically now you go on constructing this interaction. And you want to, to have survived only the Kitayev interaction. So if I write the Heisenberg Hamiltonian in a very um, normal way, I have to get rid of the Heisenberg interaction. I have to get rid of Jalzinski Moria. And the Kitayev interaction corresponds to this term here, which is what we call the, uh, the gamma uh, term. So how do you do that? Well, basically, if you bring together this octahedra H sharing, um, perfect H, H sharing, you can get rid of the Heisenberg interactions. If you have inversion symmetry, you can get rid of the Jalzinski Moria. And the interactions that survive are indeed in interactions between the neighbor's spins, which are in fact virtually coming from the interactions with these, um, with these uh, J effective three half, which is shown here, right? So it's a second order type of interaction. And this is the Kitayev interaction. So the Kitayev interaction, it's an easing type of interaction. And as you can see by the coupling, it's um, dependent on the Hund's coupling. So it only appears in a multi-orbital system with a strong spin orbit coupling. So after this suggestion, there has been many materials that have been proposed as realizations of these type of um, models. However, now the question is, 
do these materials, are these materials what we want to be? These are still liquids with, um, uh, with these fractionalized excitations. So one is you do experiments and you see whether you find signatures of the predictions by the model. And the other is you can just do up initial and extract these interactions. So for up initial, what we would do is, okay, we start by solving uh, the Schrodinger equation for my interacting system of electrons and ions. These, of course, uh, we cannot do it because of the Coulomb repulsion. These are 10 to the 23 couple equations. Uh, so what we do is we combine uh, density functional theory with uh, many body methods because these are correlated systems in order to extract the uh, properties on Hamiltonians of the system. So density functional theory, I don't need to introduce it. See, this is a very powerful theory to get information about your uh, electronic properties of the system. However, uh, this theory, when you have a strongly correlated system, the, approxi the, the strongest approximation in this theory is in the correlation. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> what, we, uh, what we do then is, I am just flashing it here, we combine the information of the electronic structure because we are now looking at realistic materials. We combine this information with uh, exact diagonalization. So we extract the parameters for a multi-orbital um, relativistic Hubbard model from the DFT. And then by projecting into a spin model, we extract information about which other important spin-spin interactions in these materials. This uh, is one, let me show you this example. This is one of the most discussed materials, alpha ruthenium trichloride. This is a layered system. It has exactly what uh, we expect these honeycomb lattices, um, and this is a van der Waals system. So basically, it forms these layers of um, ruthenium is a 4D, so it's relativistic, and we have five electrons in each ruthenium. So when we now study which are the interactions of the real, of the real system, indeed, what we find is the key diet is the strongest interaction, but because these are not perfect, there are trigonal distortions, there are also other interactions that are non-zero, like uh, small Heisenberg terms, um, like other anisotropic interactions, and they sort of indeed kill this possible uh, spin liquid ground state. And this is the case because this material orders at low temperatures in a zigzag magnetic order. So that's good. Uh, that's not good, sorry. Um, but nevertheless, <laughs> because it has this strong Kitayev interaction. So you see, this is the largest interaction. The excitations are rather anomalous. And this is already very interesting that you have, uh, these are, for instance, in the ordered phase, you have the magnons, but you also have all this um, continuum of excitations that come from uh, interacting fractionalized Majoranas. Now, because my time seems to flow very fast, um, what do we do now? Uh, okay, we wanted so much to have this spin liquid. We found, we recognized materials. Most of the materials that I show, unfortunately, or the, what can we do to go into our spin liquid? So you can start manipulating your materials and you can do it. So this is a phase diagram of this alpha ruthenium dichloride. We are here in this zigzag phase temperature. This is magnetic field. So you can apply a magnetic field, suppress the long range order, and then maybe by suppressing long range order to see whether you reach a spin liquid type of phase. And this is one of the um, most discussed uh, phase diagrams, whether there is an, uh, a fill induced spin liquid in the system um, or not. What I'm going to do is another way of manipulating um, is by applying a strain field. So you apply pressure, you apply a strain, and then you manipulate this, um, these magnetic interactions and you can get rid of what you don't want and enhance what you want, which is the Kitayev interaction. So this is now what I'm going to do in my last three minutes is I'm going to now um, just uh, bring together these uh, two systems because since there is a strong mismatch, lattice mismatch, we may expect this system is extremely soft, soft in the sense that the, um, the, 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 in, the interactions, you can manipulate them very easily with very small strains so that you get a strong, uh, a strong responses to just by doing a small strains. 
So the idea is let's bring these two together and see due to the lattice mismatch, what do I expect in this uh, system? So when we, so in App Initio, you can do these simulations by doing supercells of these, um, of these slabs, and then you, anal you let the system relax and you analyze what kind of effects of strains and charge transfer you have. One of the things that happen in this system is that there is a charge transfer and you can see it here. You recognize this is the, 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 the Dirac um, cone of the graphene. If you, we had pristine graphene, here would be the Fermi level, but because of ruthenium trichloride, there is a charge transfer from the graphene to the ruthenium trichloride, and here's our Fermi level. These are these ruthenium bands, and, um, that's, uh, and we also get a strain in the ruthenium trichloride. So now what happens, um, these kind of uh, devices have been also uh, measured and are being measured. These are various groups that are doing that. And let me just analyze what can we measure? So these are transport measurements. So we use graphene as the sensor of this alpha ruthenium trichloride. Can we learn something about the, maybe that the system is in a spin liquid type of state or not? So what um, here, what we see is the effect of the charge transfer due to these um, uh, 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 Hassan alpha oscillations and the formation of these um, pockets, so closed pockets that come from the hybridization. But what is interesting is that if you look at the fast Fourier transform of these measurements, the as a function of temperature, it has a non lipschitz kosovich um, behavior. And the question is, where does that come from? With that, we may have some information about the interaction between these two systems. And uh, one of the suggestions that we have is that what we are realizing here is a kind of Kitayev condo lattice. So we have the ruthenium trichloride that very well defined spins with these anisotropic interactions. And now we put graphene with, um, which is a conduction system so that we have the interaction of localized magnetic moments with conduction spins. And this may create a condo type of behavior. That means that I'm going to have, um, in fact, the hybridization or the interaction of the conduction electrons with the magnetic moment, and I'm going to see some screening effects. Uh, and this is what uh, we calculated with this model, and we could reproduce this non lipschitz kotzevich um, behavior. So this is this condo effect that was uh, introduced, or let's say it was uh, uh, condo explained what happens when you bring uh, localized moments with a conducting system how these conducting system are screening the magnetic uh, moment. And this physics now, it's very interesting. You bring uh, here a material that is uh, a frustrated magnet, here in our case, ruthenium trichloride. You bring, you bring it together with a semiconductor or a metal. And because of the interaction of these two layers, you expect new type of phases coming from uh, these two very disparate systems. And this is the same happening in this type of bilayers where you bring together triangular lattice of localized uh, moments. This is this one T type standalone disulfide in this charge density wave together with a conduction uh, layer, which is a one H standalone disulfide. And this kind of physics is also now very much discussed in um, twisted bilayer graphene. So, uh, Maria Jose and Lenny have done uh, um, work on that. We have also started to do work on that. So we are now getting emergence of this uh, state of matter by bringing together, in this case, very uh, two different, two very different uh, systems. Applications, there are applications of these layers just for the sake of um, showing you an application that in fact, this um, bilayer alpha ruthenium trichloride on graphene show very, so in fact, uh, a very sharp PN junctions and the uh, um, colleagues that are doing devices are using them now for, um, for uh, purposes of, uh, of quantum dots and other type of um, behavior. Okay, one minute, just let me finish now by the following. I try to, um, I try to uh, uh, motivate that quantum spin liquids is a very exotic and, and state of matter, very different concept 
from uh, ferro and antiferro magnets. And now let's look which is the knowledge, so the outreach of this concept of quantum spin liquid. Um, in fact, if you ask uh, uh, any, um, so any uh, child in the school, if you say what's a ferromagnet, everybody can think about, yes, ferromagnets, I know what it is. But if you ask about uh, spin liquids, they will tell you, <laughs> I don't know. So what I did is I went to Google Trends and you know that you can just put, a, you, you put a, a, basically, you put the search of a certain uh, concept, how many times this concept has been searched in, the, in Google. And here, what I'm showing is, this is, uh, so I just put quantum spin liquid, and I look at the range of time from uh, 2011 till now. And this is now normalized by uh, uh, the maximum, the maximum searches. So what we see is that we can identify one, two, three peaks, right? So let's see what these are these three peaks. So the first peak, um, which was um, in 2012, was precisely this Herbert Schmidt that I was telling to you. So um, here, if you see how, um, you know how journals, so how, um, in fact, uh, Periodico and Co, they put the news, but uh, what they, a new state of matter and a third type of magnetism, the discovery that could revolutionize computer storage, et cetera, et cetera. So this was, um, when uh, it was realized that this mineral, Herbert Schmidt, has these properties of a possible spin liquid with fractionalized excitations. Now let's go to the second peak, uh, which is sometime in 2015. And the second peak is this Kitaev uh, system. So mysterious new state of matter discovered, quantum spin liquid is seen in a real world material 40 years after being predicted. So this was, um, uh, Phil Anderson, and it could make computers super fast. And then it says things last, like, it was thought electrons were indivisible, building blocks of nature, but now you can break them. So, and so on and so forth. You want us to be very careful because this concept of breaking the electron is only a concept that you can do in an interacting system. So it's a collective effect. You, you will never get that in vacuum. And what about the third one, the third one, is in fact now this concept of spin liquid has gone into the ultra cold um, atoms community. And this is uh, in fact the work by, uh, by looking uh, and collaborators where they considered um, uh, Rydberg atoms and uh, they, well, here the announcement is Harvard scientists observe quantum spin liquids and never before seen state of matter. So basically, uh, with Rydberg atoms, they construct this type of entangled uh, uh, state of mind. So just that you see that uh, it's interesting to see how these concepts are going then or are translated by journalists. Anyway, so that's my end. Uh, what I wanted to do with my talk is just to uh, show a little bit the evolution of magnetism starting from the last century when uh, one was starting to try to understand just ferromagnetism. And where we went now, where now we are in the stage where we have to deal with this concept of fractionalization. And these are challenges. So basically breaking of these particles to release frustration and then find new sets of matter. And uh, I did the example of quantum spin liquids, of course. We also use this combination of methods for many other places. And, um, I thank my collaborators in, in magnetism from theory and experiment. I see that Herman is staying, and I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for this beautiful talk and very clear. So thank you. So the talk is open for questions. We have time for questions, discussion. Yes. So, Rosel, will you, will you finally say that the quantum spin liquid has been observed? Well, I, I think the so there are mm, the problem that we one is fighting with these quantum spin liquids is always disorder. And in all these systems, um, and that's why now the experimentalists are trying to get better and better samples because disorder kills you, kills you the state very easily. 
So I wouldn't say that we have a clear case of quantum uh, spin liquid, but uh, I can say that one sees an evolution where we are seeing more and more signatures of this state. But it's now a matter, so it's very different from quantum polar effect, where you don't care about, I mean, basically the zone that doesn't matter for the state because Landau levels are Landau levels. But here, forget it, it's, it's very much sensitive. Can I have this? Ask the second question. Yeah, sorry, second question. Ask so question. what is the signature that you're looking for to determine that you have? Exactly. So fractionalized excitations. And one of the, one of the uh, let's say, bottleneck experiment are these thermal hole conductivity experiments. Because there, if you have these fractionalized excitations, you, um, you predict quantization of your thermal hole conductivity. And this is the bottleneck. So if one sees that, then you are sure you have their quantum spin liquid. In neutrons, the problem is that neutrons, you measure with neutrons has a spin one. So um, neutrons, whenever you have fractionalized excitations, you are going to see a diffuse spectrum. And you can always uh, give many reasons for this issue. Uh, it's not a bottleneck type of experiment, but um, thermal hole conductivity is the measurement. More questions? Yes. <clears throat> so, but uh, would you say then that the alpha routine is the best candidate for the Kitaev model, or do you think there is another material? Um, so far is the best candidate. And that's why in this construction here, what we see indeed in this construction here, because the interactions that are spoiled, the spin liquid, is that you have uh, the ruthenium and ruthenium are very nearby. So you have a lot of um, direct type of interactions and you just don't want them. So you, what you want is to blow up the structure. If you blow up the structure, you kill these interactions and they are the left ones and the KDF ones. And what we saw here indeed is that when you do this construction, we are reaching, we're more and more into this KDF limit. And this model that I was showing to you was assuming that it is in the KDF model. So still, this is one of the best candidates when you manipulate it. Yeah. And uh, regarding the Heisenberg model, you said that on the triangular lattice, uh, there's no it is known that there is no... It's the perfect the, triangle the perfect lattice. Triangle lattice right? But if you are in an isotropic, you can get a lot of spin liquids there. Yeah. My question is, uh, is it the Kagome lattice, the one that uh, theoretically is more... Uh, yes. So there are... For a spin yes. So there are, there are uh, quite a few numerical results on the Kagome. The only this question in the Kagome is what kind of spin liquid you have. Do you have a U1 spin liquid? Do you have a gap spin oh. liquid? That's a discussion there, but that the, there is a spin liquid. This is quite um, a, a quite a consensus, um, as far as I know from all the numerical calculations. So there is no way there that you get uh, this uh, 120 whatsoever. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, nice lecture, especially for the introduction, because there are many students here, and I think it was very useful for them. Not that much for the, the second part, but the introduction was uh, beautiful. Uh, okay, so my question is uh, about uh, the if it's important the uh, being having this material as uh, metallic or or isolating because if you have probably metallic, you will have the uh, also indirect interaction, you will have Honda uh, type of effects, and uh, especially in the sense, for example, the quantum phase transition used by magnetic field is all story already, like uh, mm -hmm. uh, in Germany, Karl uh, yeah, yeah, no, I know this group. Uh, I also was involved somewhere 25 years ago in this uh, story. And uh, uh, if there are some kind of signatures of quantum spin liquids in these old stories uh, where the quantum uh, transition were tuned by pressure, by magnetic field. So. Yeah. So, okay, there are two questions. I think one is about metallic 
and the other one is about quantum quantum critical behavior. So these systems are insulated. So this kind of physics is really you need a mod insulator. However, that's what I was showing to here with uh, here in this case that what you can create is condo type of physics by bringing the system together with uh, a metal. Now, I, I think that you, what you're asking is about quantum criticality that has been very much discussed. Um, for instance, when you go from, uh, let's say, a balance one state to a spin spiral state, this type of, um, this is being, yeah, okay. This is the discussion in this phase diagram here. Uh, maybe just show you where was my phase diagram. Here, that's here, precisely here, the discussion is whether what you have here is a quantum critical point um, that there is no intermediate spin liquid state, but you have a quantum critical point that goes from this phase to a partially polarized phase. And this is, indeed, there is a lot of work about talking about quantum criticality. Um, but still, I am here in the insulator, not, not in a metal. In metal, I can only construct it via these type of couplings that I was showing to you. But it's not everything. So it could well be that you can nevertheless construct, uh, you dope. So if you dope the system, if you dope KITAF, what is interesting is that then you can find um, very interesting topological superconductivity. So there is a lot of work that is being done. It's not, it's not yet everything um, settled at all. Yeah. But it's a very interesting, uh, important question, yeah. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, one quick. Yeah, maybe can you throw in a few words about the theoretical uh, computational problems? Oh, some, yes. It's been uh, yes. Newtonian, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, what do we do with the spin Hamiltonian, or how do we derive the spin Hamiltonian? Uh, once you have it, oh. One, one, okay, so yeah, once yeah. we have this spin Hamiltonian, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. because this is a frustrated system, we cannot do quantum Monte Carlo. So we have, we are very reduced about treating this Hamiltonian. So what we do is exact analyzation. So these calculations here, for instance, in this case, uh, these calculations to get this uh, spectra was done an exact analyzation. You take uh, uh, 24 sites and you do the exact analyzation of this model. You can also do the MRG, but in 2D, the MRG, you have to be very careful, as you know. Um, uh, but this spin model, the problem is that in quantum Monte Carlo, you have the sign problem. And you can only treat that at very special points where the sign problem is not there. The other methods, so dynamical mental theory, and we use that when we bring together, so when we, have, we go into this metallic condo, physics, then we do dynamical midfield theory to understand this kind of physics. But otherwise, um, the spin models here, uh, you are rather limited um, by the frustration. Thank you. Is there any questions by the young people in the audience? So master degree people. You have your professors here, right? So you can take advantage. Well, you can also say what you didn't understand. <laughs> I'll be happy to say it in other words. <laughs> okay, so maybe we can, oh, no? Okay, very nice, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, the part that was most interesting one was uh, about how do you use those large data sets of materials? I suppose that privileged computes by lifting to to get insight about what possible candidate would you would be the most suitable to find such weird quantum types. Yeah, yeah. So I should that person, right? Is this how so how I get how I choose from these systems the one that I would expect to be most prominent? Is that your question? Or maybe I... Um, I think that you passed the slide. I passed uh, the slide, okay. It was the slide about uh, where you use uh, yes, that slide. That? The, the previous one. Yes. Uh, when you say that you uh, use statistical learning ah, to, ah, to information okay. from large databases. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, I didn't, I flashed it, but I never really presented here. Thank you very much for the question, but I don't have the time, but I can tell you a little bit. So indeed, what I showed today was more on this part here, where we combine 
the information from the EFT because it gives us really the models, um, the, the parameters of our models, and then we treat our models. In our case, now uh, that's what Juan was asking more with ED, we also do variation on Monte Carlo, but there is a completely different way of dealing with that, which is by using um, uh, statistical uh, learning, so machine learning types. Now, the way we do that is, and here we have developed that for identifying and diagnosing topological phases. So for instance, I'm, I'm, for instance, I'm interested, you give me one minute, Herman. <laughs> I'm interested in yeah. it's for the it's for the students. It's for the, I'm interested, for instance, in churn insulators, in diagnosing churn insulators and in predicting churn insulators. And churn insulators that are not only I don't know how much you know about churn insulator, but it's a topological phase where um in fact uh, it's protected by topology. So by applying perturbations, you cannot just um, get the system out of this phase. And these phases are nowadays very interesting for whatever applications you can have quantum computing. So let's assume that I want to find materials that are churn insulator. Let's assume that you know what a churn insulator is. So what we do is we um, basically with a, a statistical method, so we create a set of uh, Hamiltonians, tight binding Hamiltonians that you can create very easily. So 10 to the 10 to the uh, 5, 10 to the 6 different type of Hamiltonian. And then what you do is you level these Hamiltonians by the churn, uh, by calculating the churn number, which is very fast. And then what I do is we do um, a statistical, so uh, apply a statistical concepts like, for instance, the Bataasharya distance to identify. Um, so I should Show, show you, I can show you later if you want. So to identify which um, set of parameters that define a certain material would be good for having the short insulator. So it's it's really a data, a data um, mining, but by using the concepts of uh, machine learning in material design. And I can show you if you want a little bit more in detail, but I, I didn't go into that because Herman would have killed me <laughs> if I take more time. So, well, thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Some more questions or comments by the young people? I have just a very short point, maybe. So you have been mentioning uh, the, the, the quantum Hall effect or microscopic experiment. Now, would that be my I'm not the expert on okay. <laughs> this. So, I mean, would there be a microscopic experiment where you can identify these particles? So, I mean, for example, in this change which you have in superconductors, yes. where you see in both parts yes. of the change, yes. it usually tells you that there is something which may be separating. So, is there something similar? Yeah, that? well, in fact, I was talking about this thermal hole, but, uh, but there are other, there are optical measurements where you would expect. Uh, so, for instance, if you do now, people are doing second and more generation. That's why it was uh, uh, a lot of uh, nonlinear optic experiments. Because if you have these type of fractionalized excitations, you are also going to expect certain resonance that are not there if you don't have a fractionalized excitation. So, people are going now very much into these nonlinear optics to see effects of these fractionalized excitations. But it's just still a little bit more thermal. Thermal hall was very clear. Um, the, the prediction was very clear here. One is has to uh, work a little bit more, but it's true that in optics, people is trying that. Uh, people, so, for instance, new SR type of experiments. So there is a lot of probes. It's only the problem is that there is is there another explanation from what you are seeing? You have all, always to be careful about whether you took care of all the details. But yes, I, an STM. I'm not sure. <laughs> Because I haven't seen anybody doing, I we ask we ask to do STM on, on these their structures, and I think in Weizmann they are doing that, but I haven't seen any results. That is maybe something you can look at. <laughs> well, you, I mean, uh, you, you and your colleagues. Okay, so I think we can stop here. So thank you very much, Jose, for being here.